Hi, and welcome back to the UK's human landscape. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so down below. And today in lesson six, we are looking at inequality in London. As we mentioned before, London is going to be our major case study and it's gonna take up much of the coming lessons in this unit. Now, when we're talking about inequality, this is a concept that comes up quite frequently in geography. We can talk about it on a variety of scales from global, national, and local and regional. So today, when we're talking about inequality in London itself, we're talking about some of the starkest inequality between the very, very wealthy and the most deprived in the UK. Now, if this sounds odd to you, because we talked in a previous lesson about the UK's north-south divide and the fact that on average, London and the South East are much wealthier than the North, then I understand that, okay? But when we're looking at it in a different scale, what we're saying is, although the average for London and the South East is very, very wealthy, there are pockets, small areas, in which high levels of deprivation exist. And in fact, those levels of deprivation are amongst the worst in the country. So today we're going to look at it as a broad issue. And next lesson, we're going to look at comparing two locations which have very, very different levels of wealth, access to services and other important social and economic indicators. So starting off our thinking for today's lesson about inequality, I'd like you to just write me a short paragraph, two or three sentences, to explain why you think that there is inequality in London. Why is there not everybody with the same amount of wealth, the same access to education, the same access to services? Why is it that there is inequality in London? Just start me off Use an example if you can think of one. There will have been plenty in the news either in the last month or in the last year or two. If you found that quite easy, then I'd like you to try the challenge. Do you think that inequality in London is improving or do you think it's getting worse? Are things becoming more equal? Are the poor getting richer and the rich, you know, sort of staying at the same level or even getting poorer? Or are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer and the gap between them getting wider? What do you think might even happen in the future? Can you relate some of what's going on in our sort of present scenario to what might happen in the future? Will it have a bigger impact? on some people than others? Will it have a bigger impact on wealthy people? Give it a go. Just put down your thoughts. Before we start this lesson, it's really important that we do reflect on what we already think without just basing it on what I tell you. I want you to make sure you have that down. Okay. So, moving on then, thinking about this cartoon. Now, political cartoons like this always have a message and the key here is for you to be able to decode what do we think the comment that is being made by the artist is here. Sometimes the phrases or the, the captions they help a little bit but what do we think's going on in the, this cartoon? What's the message that they're trying to get to? So we've got two sort of sides to the cartoon. On the left here we've got this big fat guy with a label on him. It makes things a lot easier, doesn't it? The rich top 10%. And he's eating a pie. He's eaten half of the pie. The pie is labeled income. And then on this side, a large number of people labeled the bottom 90% or the great unwashed. And the top 10% guy is saying to the bottom 90%, well, I left you half. What are you greedy? Now, in terms of our message here, do we think that they, the cartoonist is supportive of the 90% or of the top 10%? Can you write for me a little bit, please? Two sentences at least. What does the cartoon show? What is the artist trying to say? Go to your worksheet, please. Okay, so now that that's done, you should have worked out that, of course, the title of this lesson is clearly in this cartoon. The idea in this cartoon is that there is an unequal distribution or share 
of income. So if the pi is income, there's an uneven share. Just 10% of the population, the wealthiest 10%, get half of the pi compared with the other 90%. And we're going to look at this in a bit more detail in a moment. But a really key term then to start off this lesson is inequality. And can you make sure that that goes onto your sheet? Now, inequality is a word that can be used in a variety of different circumstances. You could even use it in maths. Inequality means that things are not the same, okay, between two comparable things. So they're not the same in size or maybe in their situation. When we use this word in geography, we mean social or economic inequality. And when we say that, we mean that there's an uneven distribution. The sharing out of these things is not exactly the same between everyone. OK, and we might be talking about assets, the things that we own, the resources, the things that earn us money and the income that we have, the wealth that we earn. And all of these different things can be unequal. Now, we're going to talk about inequality again and again throughout this course. In this case, today, we're talking about inequality within London. We have in a previous lesson talked about inequality in the UK. And when we come to the development unit, we will talk about global inequality. OK, so variety of scales here for this inequality, key, key term. Let's move on then to task two. Just before we do that, we're going to have a look at some examples. I just want you to look carefully at these pictures. I hope that you all know from English the word juxtaposition. And I've used particularly these two images because they show a strong juxtaposition between those people that have a huge amount of wealth and those people that do not have a huge amount of wealth. Those people that have a home, a secure job, money to buy fancy suits, and those that might be a lot worse off. And down here, I give you a moment, I'm not going to tell you what that's a photo of, I do hope that some of you can identify what it's a photo of before I tell you. So have a little look at this photo down here while I talk to you about what's in the box. So in 2012, this data is a little bit old. Yeah, we've talked about the fact that a lot of the data we use can sometimes be a bit out of date, but it is still reliable. So in 2012, only over 2 million people in London, 28% of its population and 1, 1 million of the UK's poorest people live in poverty. So if we've said in a previous lesson that there are 8 million people in London, over 2 million people, yeah, over a quarter of them are living in poverty. And at the same time, a million of the UK's wealthiest people call London home. So we have the poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich living side by side, sometimes surprisingly close to one another in this city. And this contrast of income and opportunity, health, all of that has a real impact on the whole city and the characteristics of different areas. Part of the reason behind that is London has the most unequal pay distribution of any part of the UK, completely down to the pay at the top end, okay? What we're saying is the rich in London are richer than rich people elsewhere in the UK, but the poor are not that much poorer than poor people elsewhere in the UK. But, you know, if you live in Wales and you earn the same amount as somebody living in London, does your money buy you the exact same things? Perhaps the cost of living in London being higher makes the person living in London poorer than the person living in Wales because they might have less ability to buy the same things that are required for their life. Even just on a basic level, if your rent takes up more than half of your wages, paying for your home takes up more than half of your wages, you have less to spend on food, education, leisure, so, the top 10% of employees in London receive at least £1,420 a week, which is £350 higher than the next highest area of the UK, region of the UK. The bottom 10% in London are no more than £340 a week, only 40% higher than the next highest region. So, 
thinking about the proportion of people in London who are experiencing poverty. I've got two graphs here. They are quite a big time difference between them, 1980 to 2010. And what I want you to look at when we're looking at these pie graphs is the fact that there are three categories. There are two years. I want you to write me three bullet points that compare the main changes between the number of people who are poor or wealthy and the number of people who are poor or wealthy between 1980 and 2010. Okay, pause the video, go to your worksheet, get an answer down, please. So what we notice then over time is that in London, the poorest people, which were 20% of the population in 1990, have actually grown to 36% of the population. Now, over a third of the population is in the poorest category when it didn't used to be that way. The wealthy, however, have also grown. The wealthy category has grown from 15% to 27%. And it's the middle that has actually shrunk most dramatically. Okay, now this is a short description question. It doesn't ask you for reasons, but we're going to explore some of those. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is to watch a video for me. Now, it's unusual for me to put videos inside these videos. and I know that seems a bit odd, um, but I just do think that this is a really excellent video. Um, it's something that I show not just to you guys at GCSE, but I also show it to my A-level economics students and A-level geography students because it's an interesting one to really challenge our perceptions. What do we think about how wealth is shared out or distributed amongst people in the UK. And I think that it really gets you to see how extreme this inequality is. So what I'm going to ask you to do is the following. You're going to click on the link here. You're going to play the video. And at sort of two minutes in, you need to pause the video, write down a couple of bullet points, things that you've heard, maybe go back a bit, okay, if you need to hear it again. And you need to get to up to six bullet points of information from this video. Okay, off you go. So now that you've seen that video, I want to talk about a really key distinction between two words that sound very similar. Now, this is really important because they have very different meanings and they can help to add that bit of detail and understanding to an answer for somebody who's particularly looking for those eights and nines grades. So equality is where people are equal. And we've already started this entire lesson by saying inequality exists. Some people have more than others, okay? In this image, everybody has one box, but some people can't see what's going on at all. Some people have got an excellent view. Some people could just about see it. In society, that might mean that everyone was paid exactly the same, no matter how many fat people they had in their family to feed, no matter whether or not they had uh, a disability and therefore couldn't work, everybody would get exactly the same. And to be honest with you, if I told you, you were all going to get the same exact grade at the end of the year, regardless of how much work you put in, you wouldn't feel that that was fair. So although we talk about equality and fairness often together, in many people's minds, equality doesn't always mean fairness. Equity is a similar word to equality, but it's more about being fair. Equity says that people that need more should get more help. In this case, this shorter person has got two boxes so that they may also observe the game. This person's got one box because they do need some help. And this person who has no, no need of any help is not receiving any. Often within society, and particularly if we think about things like taxes and the benefit system, we are looking not for equality, for everyone to have the exact same, but for us to have equity for some people who need more help 
getting more help, and some people who don't need it, not getting it. So in our video that we've just watched, you should have seen this image, and it says how we think wealth is distributed. And that's because people don't expect wealth to be equally shared amongst everyone. They don't want people to earn exactly the same amount, partly because you want to believe that hard work pays off and earns you more money later on. But you will have also have seen that actually how wealth is really distributed is much less equal, but also much less equitable, i.e. when we look at this, we don't think that this looks fair. So the reason why we might not think this looks fair is because the poorest 20% of the population earns less than one hundredth of the richest 20% of the population. So if the poorest 20% had 0.6% of the income in the country, the richest 20% have 60% of the income in the country. And this is not just unequal, it is unequal, but it's not just unequal, but it's also unfair. So, how do we measure, how do we look at people that are not in the same position? How do we say, okay, this is the place where it's the worst? And we've talked already quite a lot about money, haven't we? I don't necessarily need to only focus on money, though. Let's say, for example, that in this image, these boxes don't represent wealth, but they represent help in exams, access to good teachers, or access to appropriate health care that's going to be, you know, suitable for, for that person. So it doesn't just have to be wealth. And so when we're measuring where people are lacking something, and the word that we're using for this is deprivation, to be deprived of something. Yeah, If mum and dad sent you to bed without dinner, they've deprived you of your dinner. Okay, They've taken it away from you. Well, we can talk about income deprivation, being poor, but that's not the only thing. Income deprivation is often linked to employment deprivation, not having a job, or maybe if you want to work full time, you can work full time, but you can't find a job to employ you full time, you are deprived in terms of employment opportunities. There are not enough chances for you to earn that income. A good example of this might be somebody like an Uber driver. When it's busy, their income might be good. But if the number of people taking Uber rides goes down a lot, then their income might drop with it and they might find themselves struggling to find work. Education and training and health deprivation and disabilities are also a major aspect of deprivation. If you don't have access to good education, skills and training, how could you possibly have good employment? And without that, it's really difficult to have a high income. Similarly, if your health is poor, if you are disabled, having access to these other things is really hard. If the area you live in has high crime rates, that can cause issues. If there's high pollution, the living environment is not positive. And if you can't even find somewhere to live that's affordable or get access to your local services, like the GP is a really long way away, that also has an impact. So altogether then, we can combine these different factors and they get combined into what we call the index of multiple deprivation. All of these are different indicators, different ways of thinking of what people might not have that makes things unfair or unequal. And we can combine them to see which areas are not just missing out on one, but on all of these different things. Now, we're not just going to look at the IMD or Index of Multiple Deprivation in this lesson. One of your, your next lesson will look at it in comparison between two areas of London. And the lesson after that will be coming back to this data when we look at a particular case study. And we're going to do a bit of GIS work, which is quite exciting. Um, it's also a really fantastic source of data for our 
primary investigation. When we do our field work, we're going to use this to do our secondary data. So, based on what we've discussed here, I'd like you to go to the Caboodle textbook. We haven't used it in a few lessons, okay, but I would like you to go back to it. And I'd like you to look at page 178 and 179 and answer questions 1, 2 and 3, okay. Give them a go, they shouldn't take too long. Logging into Caboodle, if you need to reset your password, it's nice and easy. Use your school email address, please. Off you go. Right, hopefully you have gone and looked at those questions. You've read those two pages and you've answered them. The answers are on the next slide for you to check, okay? Make sure you're not just copying the answers, but you are actually reading the pages. Plenty of information on there. Right, last little bits of this lesson. Now, this is a major thing. We haven't done it in a little while because it's difficult, I feel, uh, to do exam question practices when we're not at school. But it's a really important skill and it's something I don't want you falling behind on. And it fits so well into this lesson, I felt the need to include it. So, we're going to look at an 8 marker. and We haven't done an 8 marker in a while. We're going to look at one that specifically relates to this exam paper. It will have a resource with it. So as you can see here, I have a map and we're going to analyse that map in just a moment. I'm going to take you through the steps of looking at this data, looking at this information, coming up with some points, okay? And then I've given you some space on your worksheet for you to write a full answer to this question. I would like you to write it so that it can be marked, please. Okay, I will be checking your work. I will be marking it on Google Classroom if you actually do the work. It will be really, really helpful feedback. Okay, so let's have a little look at what we've got. Assess the causes of differences in life expectancy shown in figure one. And what we have here in figure one is this fabulous map with lots of lines all over it. I hope some of you recognise that it is in fact London's underground network or tube network as it's very famously known. Let's have a look at what the title tells us. Lives on the line. How even short journeys on London's underground show up differences in life expectancy and child poverty in the city. We've been given this key down here and it gives us red numbers, black numbers, and some colour coded for child poverty. Now, if we're being careful about this, what we should notice is that life expectancy at birth surrounding the station. So people living around each station have a life expectancy of this many years on average. And in the background is where we're seeing our child poverty indicated. Now, that would be really easy to miss, wouldn't it, if we weren't looking carefully at the key we've been provided with. This bit down here is amongst the least deprived, up here amongst the most deprived, and then there are sort of odd pockets down here of, of not that deprived, okay? Um, of course, looking at a map, we need to make sure that when we're referencing it, we're talking in compass directions. We want to say that this is the east of the map. This is East London and this is West London, North and South. And of course, the river is going to make a really interesting reference point if you choose to use it. So let's have a look at this data then. What are we seeing? What's the overall thing that we're going to end up talking about? We know there are differences from the question in life expectancy. We're going to talk about the causes, but we've also got to talk about what we find here, the evidence we've been provided with. So let's have a look. Can anybody spot for me the lowest number, the lowest number of years that someone's expected to live in the areas that we've been given? Aha! over here, Star Lane, 75 years. Now that doesn't sound awful, does it, to live to 75 years old? But if you think that only a few miles west, you could live for an additional 12 years in any of these places that say 87, an extra 12 years of your life just based on a few miles difference between where you are born. And this is of course hugely down to the way in which these people grew up and the amount of money, unfortunately, that they have and what that ends up giving them. So what we're saying is people living in East London are much, much more deprived than those living here or born here in central London. And this is reflected in how long they end up living 
So let's dive into this information a little bit more because sometimes it can be a difficult link to make to say, okay, you're poor, but that also means that you're not healthy and you're going to die sooner. Okay. And why is it that those things don't change? Why can't the next child in the family grow up, be really rich and everybody else uh, benefits from it? Why is it that this continues to happen? So have a little look at these two things then. So on the left here, I've got some premature mortality rates for Newham. And next lesson, we're going to look at Newham in more detail. In Newham, what we find is for every 100,000 people that die, okay, there is an extra 351 people that die in Newham, okay? And of cardiovascular or heart disease rates, that is also higher than normal. So compared to the England average, okay, significantly higher numbers of people are dying. And in reference to something that cannot possibly be ignored in a geographical context at the moment, of course, the coronavirus pandemic is in fact showing the big differences between those that have good quality of life and high levels of wealth and those people that don't. So I'd like you to have a little look at this extract of an article that I took from the Financial Times deprived areas remember we said what deprived meant it meant that they don't have certain things it might be wealth it could also be employment opportunities it could be educational opportunities healthcare services and everything else okay so deprived areas are hit hardest in the uk by the pandemic so the analysis from the ons clearly shows that the pandemic is exacerbating existing large health inequalities what we're saying is it's always been unfair, as we've seen over here in this data, the health inequalities have not been, uh, you know, just appearing recently. They've been there for a while, but they are being made worse. They are being exacerbated by the global pandemic that is going on right now. And three places are mentioned specifically, and they make for interesting reading. Brent, where we are based, where our school is, has been one of the worst hit, along with Newham, where we will be studying next lesson, and Hackney, another area of East London. And they've been the worst hit areas with death rates of up to four times the national average. So Brent in Northwest London was identified early on as a hotspot in the uh, in the pandemic, with Northwick Park having to declare a critical in incident when they ran out of intensive care beds. In Newham, though, the highest rate in the country. So the same place that we see in this older data from 2016, 2018, okay, that more people are dying in Newham than elsewhere, that continues in our current pandemic. And as we mentioned last lesson, Newham is also one of the most diverse places in the UK. And along with its high diversity and very unfortunate high death rate, it's also one of the poorest places in London. And up to 48% of people in Newham live in poverty after they've paid their rent and their household income is taken into account. So what we're saying is, Living in poverty makes you vulnerable. It makes you at risk of these other things. And then that can lead to worse outcomes, not just in income, but also in life expectancy. Okay. And there are some other things down here, details about why this is maybe occurring. The population has been particularly exposed to being infected because of the high density of the population, with many people in low-wage work working in the service economy and going back to overcrowded, multi-generational households and exposing younger members. Now, there's a lot of different factors built up in there. One, if you live on low wages, you're working on low wages, you probably don't have loads of space at home. You might live with lots of other people, including your parents or grandparents, okay? So multi-generational houses also increase the risk to individuals. So we can see that inequality in London is actually making even the impacts of something completely unexpected like the coronavirus much, much worse. Let's go back to our exam question now. So 
we're going to write an answer to the question, which is here at the top, assessing the causes of difference in life expectancy. And we're going to follow the following structure. Your introduction is just one sentence, and I want you to define the key term, okay? Key terms up here, obviously, life expectancy. What the hell does that mean? Make sure you define it right at the beginning. Tell the examiner you know what it means. Then you're going to write at least two PE paragraphs, and I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail, okay? How do we break a question down like this into just two things that we really want to discuss, okay? And then finally, we're going to have a concluding sentence. We're going to bring those factors together. If we go back to that article, we can clearly see they've given us some data, they've given us some evidence, and then they've given us a concluding sentence. They've tied lots of things together. So we're going to summarise those factors and decide, very importantly, which one has been the most significant or most important or the worst aspect, okay? Now, that varies from question to question. When we're looking at this particular question, then, we might say, what is the worst cause? Because we're being asked to assess the causes of differences in life expectancy. So we need to think about what these causes are going to be. So our P paragraph, our, our sort of P paragraph might look something like this, okay? It doesn't have to look like this, but it might do. So it might start off with one social factor that causes difference in life, differences in life expectancy is... And it could be, say, for instance, living in multi-generational households or not having access to very healthy food or eating a lot of fast food. It could be an economic difference. We've talked about wealth quite a lot. It could be an environmental difference. It could be that there's high levels of pollution in that area. You're going to give some individual detail. And when we're talking about this evidence, where does the evidence come from? Of course, it has to come from our map. OK, this one here that we were given right at the beginning. If we don't refer to it, we're going to lose marks. And then we're going to explain it. We've got to explain why it's important. If you don't have the word because or this leads to or this means that in your PE paragraph, it's not a proper one. OK, I want those linking connectives, please. So. Just before we look at the two sides of our argument, the sort of split of our argument, I want you to understand how the marks are allocated in this question. Now, there's eight marks overall. And in any exam question where they give you eight marks and they give you a graph or a map, any kind of figure, they expect you to use it. And half of those marks, half of those eight, are under what we call assessment objective four. And it requires you to take or extract information, facts and figures from the resources provided and to make some comments about them. OK, so four marks for taking some evidence and talking about it in a geographical way. The other four marks are for this part of the question up here, assessing the causes. So you want to make judgments about why we find this evidence in here. OK, which is the most significant thing? Got a couple of little key terms down here that we've already mentioned throughout this lesson. Deprivation, the lack of something. It could be employment, it could be income, it could be uh, access to services, it could be access to education. Life expectancy, absolutely key. You couldn't possibly answer this question without using the phrase life expectancy. Income, of course, is one of the major causes of differences in life expectancy. So we might want to mention that. It might become our concluding sentence that is the most significant. And we're going to think about quality of life. OK, so we've had a little look at this. And I want you now to remind yourself, if we were going to split this, what did we say about this map? What were the two sort of obvious splits on this data? Hopefully you can tell me that in the east of London, you have a lower life expectancy. And in the centre of London, although it is he, in this case on the west of our map, we have higher life expectancies. And we're going to use that to create our two PE paragraphs. Our first PE paragraph is going to be, on one hand, we have high life expectancies, somewhere around 87 years in central London. And on the other hand, we have low life expectancies, below 80 years in East London. And for each of these, we're going to think about the causes of those differences. Here's the difference. 
yeah and it's going to be part of my AO4 isn't it and then I'm going to talk about causes and then we're going to make a decision about what they were so on one hand high life expectancy the O4, specific information. Central London locations have life expectancies of 86 years and above, as well as having the lowest levels of child poverty. Don't forget that on here we had two pieces of information. We had life expectancies, didn't we? But we also had child poverty. Now, if we're being realistic, child poverty tells us a lot about how wealthy families are. Okay, Their parents are included in that in some way. This indicates that residents are wealthier, low levels of poverty means you're wealthier, and as a result, this leads them living longer lives. Our AO3, this is our development, this is our judgment section, okay? In relation to having what we've said already, higher incomes lead to longer life expectancies because people are able to purchase better quality food or less fast food. They can afford to live in cleaner and healthier locations. They might not be cramped. They might not be crowded. They might have fresher air and they might have higher levels of education, which means that they have better paid jobs, which allows them to have a better quality of life overall. Okay, now some of the things that we're going to put on the other hand are going to be opposites, but I would suggest that when you're writing an eight marker, don't say the same thing the opposite way round, okay, just for the other side, because you won't get any extra marks, you'll just be capped at however many you got from the first paragraph. So make sure that they're different. If on this first hand you chose to go with um, the sort of quality of food and that kind of thing, then maybe on this side you're going to go with the economic stuff. I've put them both on here, but in your answer, you wouldn't do both, okay? So on the other hand, East London has lower life expectancies, and we're using specific data, often under 80 years old. For example, people in West Ham live nine years less than in Black, Black, Blackfriars. East London also has higher levels of deprivation, including child poverty. So now we're going to analyse that. We're going to make a judgment about the information. High levels of deprivation means that families are more likely to live in poor conditions, leading to worse health and earlier deaths. Deprivation will also affect educational outcomes of young people, which impacts their future job opportunities and income. And in the long term, it impacts their quality of life. Right. We have done that now in quite a lot of detail in terms of planning. What I would like you to do is to pause the video. Having heard all of that explanation, write an eight mark answer using this structure. Introductory sentence, two PE paragraphs and a concluding sentence that I can then mark for you. Okay, if you get horrendously stuck, watch the video again. If you're still stuck after that, I have put some answers in the next couple of slides, but please, please, please give it your best go on your own. Finally then, here are some of our answers, okay? I would like you please, having a go over your answers, to just use the highlighter tool on your document and highlight for me in your PE paragraphs where you have done the things I've asked you to do. Where's your first point? Where's your evidence? Where's your explanation? Okay. And then using these answers that are in here, I would like you to rewrite just one of your paragraphs so that it's practically perfect. And what you'll notice is this stuff here is the AO2 or AO4 understanding. And this bit here is the AO3 information okay as i've said i am going to mark your work okay so don't stress and don't change everything to make it perfect because then i can't see what you're good at and what you're not finally then please do not forget to do your homework your homework this time is to read an article on the urban decline of london's docklands i want you to use bullet points to summarize why the docklands fell into decline and i want you to find two photographs please before and after, or four photographs, sorry, two before and two after of London's Docklands that give us a visual comparison of what it looked like before the decline and after the decline. 
I will see you next lesson. Have a great afternoon, guys.